Hi there. My name is Richard Davey, and I run the company Photon Storm. I set it up in 2012, and I formed the company because I could see the change from Flash going away and HTML5 coming in, and I wanted to be there at the cusp of that. We spent many years developing games for clients and released lots of them since then. But for the past few years, I've been working full time and specifically on developing Phaser, which is our HTML5 game framework, and also leading the community that's centered around it. Now, what is Phaser? I'll keep this section brief because I'm sure many of you are familiar with it or have at least heard of it already. But Phaser is an open source HTML5 game framework released under the MIT license. I published the very first version to GitHub back in April 2013. Now, the web was a very different place back then. To give you some context, we had Firefox at 20% browser share and IE and Edge at 28%. So it was a much more level playing field than we see today. 23% of web visitors were using Windows XP, of all things, with a resolution of just 1024 by 768. It was a, before the time when everyone was getting their mobile phone out. For games, we could either use Canvas API, which was pretty much brand new, or CSS, because WebGL support isn't going to actually land in iOS for another year and a half. Um, Web Audio won't arrive for another four years. So, like I said, a, a very different landscape, both in terms of technology and platform. I created Phaser because I needed it. It was as simple as that. I was building HTML5 games for clients day in, day out, and there was just nothing available at the time that met my demand, so I built something that did. And after I released it, uh, people took notice of it. Developers started using it, and the rest, as they say, is history. Since that time, Phaser has been used to create thousands and thousands of games played by literally hundreds of millions of people, uh, from the Minecraft Hour of Code games to massively multiplayer I.O. games. It genuinely never ceases to amaze me what developers manage to create with it. Honestly, it's quite humbling and validating to both of my hard work and of web gaming as a platform. Now, Phaser has evolved quite dramatically over the last seven years. When I very first released it, it was actually built on a beta release of TypeScript. They, they weren't even at version 1.0 then, and it was, it was actually quite a painful and bug-prone experience. But, you know, it was something that we felt needed to do at the time because we were traditionally Flash developers. So we had the type safety of ActionScript, and we wanted to recreate it on the web. Um, we were still focusing on Canvas because WebGL just wasn't there on mobile and people wanted their games to work across desktop and mobile. You know, that was the dream of HTML5. It was a few years later with the version 2 release where we were building on top of Pixie, which was an upcoming renderer at the time. And that gave us the power to focus on both Canvas and WebGL. And thanks to funding, things basically just carried on going. And Phaser was being adopted more and more. And we hired developers and we worked full time on the version 3 release. Um, again, we were looking at um, using JavaScript we, because it was still a place back, time back then when ES6 modules just, just weren't there. We, we, everyone's having to deal with Babel and transpiling. And it just wasn't you know, you know, the environment that we have today. Um, so we created a custom renderer from scratch, which focused again on Canvas and WebGL. Um, and you know, we've really built on that since that point. So there have actually been over 30 releases of Phaser 3 published since that time. And I'm actually getting ready to release the 3.5 release right now, which is the single largest one since the, you know, the framework's first been started. Now, because of the changes in the browser space, both in terms of features and tooling, Phaser 4 will actually be a complete reboot of the framework. Uh, it's fully written in TypeScript, now version 4 as well, using ES build for bundling. It's completely modular, which will allow you to ingest it into, you know, modern browser environments. Um, and it has a completely new renderer capable of 2D and 3D. So we're splitting that up. So we would include Canvas, it would include WebGL, and we will obviously move to WebGPU when standards there start to solidify and things settle down a bit. So if you track the life of Phaser from 2013 to today and beyond, it's a pretty close match to the way in which browser technology has evolved as well. I mean, obviously, I can't pivot quite as fast as the tooling space does, but it's still a constant process of evolution and not a case of sitting still. And I think that's something that game developers also have to struggle with when it comes to web technology. It's, it is a constantly evolving and constantly moving goalpost. Um, you can't just basically publish once and be done with it anymore. So now to get to the you know the meat of this talk, and it's basically I looked at 
what are the developer pain points? So I talked to the wider web game developer community. So not just phaser developers, but you know anyone using any framework or any means of building games for the web and asked them about issues that they face on a regular basis. Because while it's important to celebrate what is good about web gaming, as a group, I feel we're only going to achieve something if we listen to those who are constantly fighting on the front lines with the reality of game development today. These issues are by no means exhaustive, but I hope you'll see some common threads amongst them. Now, I've split them into three sections. Basically, we've got the platform, so issues involving stability of the platform in which games are built. You've got tooling, so issues around building and debugging. And then you've got monetization, so how people get to your games and play them and how to get income from them. We'll start with platform. The following are quotes that I've collected from talking to developers recently. I've kept them anonymous, but you'll get the feeling from them. I can't even count how many hours we have wasted in our studio collectively fixing random issues on various combinations of devices. At this point, it is Russian roulette when everything will break again. It is shocking how something as fundamentally simple as making your game go full screen is so utterly broken across devices. The APIs are essentially too fragile to be relied upon. 90% of the bug reports we get are nothing to do with our code. Most of the time, the browser has messed up or changed how something works or obliterated the display of our game in the process. Now, unstable platform. This is a commonly reoccurring thread, which is you know, quite sad in a way. And I think it's all too easy for browser vendors to get lost inside the technology. It's easy for them to forget the real world implications of their changes. You can you know, bask in the glow of new tech like WebGPU, and that's all good and well. But I received hundreds of similar messages to the ones I've just read out. Although web technology has definitely settled down, and the baseline of WebGL1 and web audio has become more ubiquitous, you still can't rely upon it. The process of making web games was likened to building upon sand in that it is constantly shifting below you. This isn't surprising given the rapidity of change that goes on in the browser space, but it makes game developers very wary. Making a game is not like building a website. The APIs may fundamentally be the same, but that is literally about where it ends. Very often, clients do not have the budget to constantly revisit a game a few years down the line that's suddenly broken because you know maybe audio stopped working or the way in which gestures are handled is different. It also appears that the more devices you involve in the mix, then the stability just increases exponentially. And the more browsers you involve across those devices, it just continues and continues. A lot of developers gave up after fighting platform issues. And even tools like Unity and WebAssembly are not going to be able to avoid this. If an API changes, it changes for everyone, regardless of how that game was built. The next category I talked about with developers was tooling. Uh, this fell into two parts, so developing game and debugging it. On the whole, thanks to advances in apps like Visual Studio Code, there were next to no issues at all with the process of actually programming a game. Developers, both hobbyist and professional, have surrounded themselves with you know, editor setups that they feel comfortable with, and coding really isn't an issue for them. Some of them missed the visual aspects of game dev that tools like Unity and Unreal provide, but it was unanimously agreed that these tools do exist and can be found out there, Play Canvas, for example, or can be created ad hoc as needed, and it's not perceived as being a barrier to getting involved. However, where this opinion dramatically changes is in the assistance that we get when debugging our games. The consensus is that DevTools, while great, is focused on debugging websites, and it just cannot cope with the sheer volume of data or the speed at which we need to accurately profile a game, which makes sense. After all, DevTools is for debugging websites, but it also feels like a lost opportunity. Having no idea whether my shaders will actually work on a target device was crippling to the project. Having no means to remotely debug it was even worse. It was agreed that there are a number of existing professional tools that game developers can use, such as NVIDIA Insight System and the ATI tools, that could help give us the insights needed into what is going on on a per-frame rendering basis, but they're incredibly difficult to use in isolation with a browser in order to tell what your game is doing. Equally, logging data or inspecting values at runtime, especially across devices, is much harder than it should be. And while there is no guarantee that the same code will work equally across devices, without that, developers lose confidence dramatically. 
for those who want or need to persevere and try and resolve these issues when they are next to no next to no tools to you know inspect this process on a fine-grained enough level to be useful it just about finishes them off i personally feel this should be a pretty easy problem to resolve ensuring that we could run a game in a browser in a process isolated enough that nsight could pick it out without any issue that would go a really long way to helping resolve a decent number of these issues now the final section is on monetization and distribution and rather than give you lots of quotes, I feel that I would just summarize the points that came up frequently, especially because there is no real one solution to this either. In short, developers find it really hard to make money from their web games. This is assuming that the game hasn't been built directly for a client, which is a large percentage of the work that web game developers do, you know, contract and freelance-based agency work. But for those who invest in creating a game, either on their own or as part of a studio, they find it increasingly hard to get players to them and then get money from them once they have them. It's... It's ironic that the lack of a unified place in which to find web games, such as you have the iOS App Store or Steam, it makes discoverability so difficult in the first place. And once the games are out there, actually earning money is really difficult too. So it forces the developers to wrap their games and bundle them, like Cordova, for example, just so that purely so they can release them into an existing app store to circumvent this problem. A number of developers told me they have implemented their own technology, so often based on WebView, in order to target an app store so they don't have to suffer the pain of the platform itself, or as much as possible anyway. Because those with big enough budgets can afford to pay for players, you know, they can run ad Facebook ad campaigns and they can get players to their games. But it's still a crying shame that the very platform that allows anyone to create anything for anyone to see is equally the issue causing their games to never be seen. I suspect it's why, if you look at current trends, companies are targeting new platforms, such as making games inside of Messenger apps, uh, iOS app clips, Twitch games, basically instant play games. Uh, it's also why I'm rebooting Phaser 4 from scratch to take advantage of modern technology that will allow for tiny, tiny bundle sizes to allow for instant downloads and instant gaming. That, that is where, you know, casual play and instant play is where the market is shifting to, as opposed to long form play. However, I cannot help but feel that it's a real shame that game developers ignore the potential of the web because they cannot see a route to making money from it. I will end with one quote, which I feel sums things up quite well. Further improving web tech won't result in lots more devs publishing to the web. Sure, there are lots of things still to be solved, but it won't move the needle on that. Only good monetization options will. This is a really interesting quote, and I think it's fundamental to actually what is the crux of the problem with a lot of developers. I mean, you have the platform issues and you have debugging issues, but you can push past those if you are you know, determined enough. But no one's going to bother to try and do that if they can't see a means to making money at the end of it. So I think actually solving this first will force people through the harder bits of the problem, which couldn't be solved with technology. Thank you for listening to my talk. I will be open to questions now. Uh, also, you can find me at Photon Storm on uh, Twitter or just email me with the uh, address on screen. Thank you.